my paper is on um, business as war. Uh, what do I mean by this? If you start with the, you know, the, the, the classic perpetual peace by Immanuel Kant, he says, you know, he's against war, as you know, he says, well, we have to just, um, we have to nullify all the existing reasons for future wars. And he said, why is that? Because with war, we, what we do normally is we make the um, a country into a commodity and then we use people as instruments, soldiers and so, machines, instruments. So, and he talks about this idea of commodification. It's very important in my view that you know, classical philosophy focuses on war as commodity, etc. So from this notion of commodification, if you like, um, it is through this notion that war comes to be equated to business. But mind you, not just in a metaphorical way, but in a very consonant, concrete fashion, in my view. So what have I done for this little thing? This is part of a major thing that I'm doing, a new book that I'm doing on the crimes of the economy. So what I've done is I've, I've read some of those manuals that you find in business schools for managers. But a lot of them, I have to say, and I read the most radical ones, because they're very good. And what you find there, and the first sentence I got, is this, among those who control the world and protect the state, there's no one who doesn't employ swordmanship in his mind. This is a dictum, a phrase used by a 16th century Japanese sword instructor. And this opens this manual that I started reading a few months ago. So basically, it's, this, is, this type of work, which is you know, for managers, and for organizations, is work is on the art of sci and science of managing organizations in competitive situations. That's what it is. And also, what happens there, that there's a continuous reference which is made to General Sun Tzu and to Karl von Clausewitz. So basically, the managers are learning how to make war. This is what, and I continued in this analysis and research and see how, how far does the metaphor, the metaphor go, and how far is concrete, the thing, and I went on. And then I found that the, from Clausewitz himself, obviously, he said, well, business, war, and statecraft are contests between organizations. They differ only in their weapons or tools of competition. So there's this affinity between military and economic strategy, as I said, is not just allegorical, but is it, it's conceptual. Uh, because both belong to the same typology of thought. For both, we have this nucleus of action which is aimed at producing successful conducts in a hostile environment, in a very constantly changing environment. And as I said, among the crucial statements of von um, Clausewitz himself, he says at one point, he said, well, rather than comparing war to art, because you know, the art of war, we could more accurately compare it to commerce says, von Clausewitz says, which is also a conflict of human interests and activities. So in business, he says, there's no, there's no peace treaty, there's no armistice day, and only organic and adaptive organizations can thrive, etc., etc. So the manager, basically, in one of these um, manuals, is equated to a samurai, okay, who has to deal with his subordinates in a very strenuous and in a very dexterous way, uh, governing and fostering them, and as a warrior. There's another one is, which is called the way of the warrior, and you think it's war, no, it's business. They're talking about business again. So this is, uh, um, Sun Tzu is quoted throughout these manuals. Um, let me read this wonderful thing. When campaigning, be swift as the wind, in leisurely march, majestic as a forest, in raiding and plundering like fire, in standing firm as the mountains, and unfathomable as clouds move like a thunderbolt. That's, this applies to, and this starts the manuals for business and managers. So an agile organization, for example, is like a whirling, a purposeful thunderstorm. It avoids massive frontal attacks, and which are rarely effective in business and war, and they choose normally infiltration tactics. Uh, or they have this niche penetration, which are more productive. And then they give examples, for example, you know, how the Japanese use this approach of infiltrating the market rather than attacking it frontally. And how the, the USA realized how Japan, the Japanese were strong industrially only when the Japanese had already a large share of the market with this you know, maneuvering, etc. 
Um, then the other example uh, about the uh, photocopying industry, Xerox, uh, which was then destroyed by Kodak after a while through this technique, uh, which is also called guerrilla technique in marketing. Um, the other one is the Swiss, how the Swiss um, watchmakers realized that Timex was overtaking them through this guerrilla technique. They only realized, late, well, you know why? Because, because the Swiss used to sell their watches in, um, in jewelries, and Timex has the brilliant idea of, through guerrilla, to sell them in, in megastores, in ordinary shops. And so the market was destroyed. Anyway, so small firms basically are advised to use to wage this guerrilla marketing and to deploy light troops, they say. Um, these troops will have to focus on specialized competitive environments, so as I said, on niches of market segments. Um, and then they quote Vietnam at one point, business, I, I repeat, business. Vietnam forms, forms of marketing are doomed, they say, uh, because they consist of protected conflict over a mature or declining market. One of these guys says, well, had Lyndon Johnson read the second chapter of The Art of War, the Vietnamese disaster would have been avoided, he says. Um, then there's this guy, I mean, um, this guy who, as a boy, as many boys do, would play with the soldiers or would make you know, models of tanks and aircraft. Well, this guy, his name is very important, Stephen, Stephen Bangai, uh, you, once you, as a boy, you play with you know, tanks, etc., you may shift to strategic studies and tactics, etc. The guy joined uh, the Boston Consulting Group and wrote books on battles and wars, but at the same time, he was acting as a consultant, as a consultant for business people. So he did both things, and he had you know, one foot here and one foot there. That is a typical. And he said, well, I saw battles not as clashes between nations, or individual commanders, but as clashes between organizations. And von Clausewitz remains the core inspiring figure, particularly for his remark that in war, like in business, there's a gap between appearance and reality. And the gap is described by von Clausewitz as the, the, different, the gulf between the planning and the action and the execution of the thing. So that's one of the important things he said. Um, uh, then, uh, yeah, then there are all these aspects that from, from Clausewitz obviously underlined. He talks about friction, he talks about uncertainty. In war, there's always a, a degree of uncertainty, of error, accidents, technical difficulties, and the unforeseen, etc. because we are imperfect individuals, he says. And this is translated totally into the business manual as well. So there's insufficient knowledge of the enemy or of the competitor. Um, so we've got, as they say, cognitive limits. And here is the, 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 the trinity identified by, by von Klaus, which is first, in war you need primordial violence, hatred and enmity driven by blind instinct. Second, you need probability and chance is the other aspect. And third, there's a political calculation. So how to perform actions which fit this trinity is the task of the leader. This is the conclusion of one of these manuals. Then they say you have to take the notion of command. Where do you take it from? From NATO, of course. So NATO's definition of command is used by these managers. The definition is the authority invested in an individual for the direction, coordination, and control of military force. And then there's this idea of polarity, again from Clausewitz, which is applied in business, which means you know, the zero-sum game. So the win-lose situation in which Gains for one implies a symmetrical loss for another. So that's the thing which is taken from straight from, from Clausewitz. The other important thing is when they talk about what they say, the decision cycles. And there is this definition which is called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A. O-O-D-A stays for observation, orientation, decision, and action. And it's the, um, the OODA loop. What does it consist of? What do you do? This is Sun Tzu also says. Sun Tzu says the primary target in a battle is that you have, is the mind of your enemy. So basically you have to know what his or her plan is. And this is the, the thing. So basically what you have to do is you're prior to any battle, the plans of the enemy have to be attacked. That's what you do. 
Um, this is again John Boyd, as I said before. Not Bunga, I said, but that's another one. Um, so what, what you do is um, you have to go through the UDA loop of your decision-making mechanism of your own enemy and, and attack, try it. First of all, you have to implement your own decision cycle before your adversary. Then prevent the adversary from implementing their own decision cycles and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other thing is, and so this idea, mind you, is you find it incorporated, obviously, from business, then you go back to war. So in business, you find something that they take from the military. The military takes something from business and vice versa. There's this mutual exchange, which is very good. If you look at the UK military doctrine, for example, um, described in the, it's called the maneuverist approach to operations. And the definition is in this manual is, is one in which shattering the enemy's overall cohesion and, and will to fight is paramount. So significant features are momentum and tempo, which in combination lead to shock and surprise, applying constant pressure at the times and places the enemy least expects. So that's both utilize that. Um, well, you find all these type of notions anyway, well beyond the military sphere, as I said, because this decision cycle has been discussed in academic business journals, in books and in the US Marine Corps war fighting manual. They all have adopted this type of thing. But this is not surprising. Strategy, as they say, seen as a process, or if you like, as a constant adaptation to shifting situations and circumstances. Um, in, a, in a world where chance, uncertainty, ambiguity, as von Clarschwitz said, dominate, obviously refers to spheres which, are, which largely transcend the, civil, the military. And the list is very long. Civil institutions, businesses, corporations, non-military government departments, universities as well, they all have to adopt some strategies, as we know, which, by which they usually mean policy, planning of any kind. Um, one of the book that this guy wrote, it reminds me of Schumpeter. Remember the creative destruction? Well, he calls it destruction and creation, he talks about. Very interesting stuff. And we read in this manual that human behavior reveals a constant relationship with survival and that the goal of all individuals is to improve their capacity of independent action. Uh, but while competing for limited resources, however, one is forced to reduce the adversary's capacity for independent action. That's what it is. So deny them the opportunity to survive on their own terms or make it impossible for them to survive at all. Um, so you have these strategy formation schools known as the positioning school management. I have another five minutes, do I? Chair, yeah? Timekeeper, timekeeper, timekeeper. 